Okay, so we're at section 03 now. We're going to do a little bit of a review of factoring. Now, I'm just going to try to get some of the ideas of factoring back into your head. We're going to be doing factoring throughout the course of this school year, so don't think like we're going to spend just a couple days on it, and I'm going to expect you to be perfect at it, and then we're going to move on. Um, it's just kind of building baby steps. It's really just re-exposing you to some of the things you saw in Algebra 1 about factoring, um, so that way when we get back to it later on this school year, hopefully it will be just another refresher course, if you will, and we're not going to start totally from scratch. Okay? There's a lot of different tricks and techniques involved with factoring. This is an introductory video involving factoring. I'm just going to cover the real basics. We'll do the more challenging things in class over the next few days. Okay, the first method for factoring that you see on your notes sheet is called the greatest common factor, the GCF. Okay, here's what that means. The GCF is the greatest common factor. It's the largest number, variable power, or both that all terms are divisible by. Basically, it's, it's in the name. It's the factor, the biggest factor, that everything has in common. So here's an example of some. So if I ask you to find the GCF of 3x cubed, 9x squared, and 18x, what you would do is you'd look at the numbers first and you'd say, all right, what's the biggest thing that divides evenly into 3, 9, and 18? And the answer there is 3. What is the biggest power of x that divides evenly into all of these powers of x? It's just the x. So 3x is the GCF, okay? Always check for the GCF first. As I have written here, it's corny, but it's true. The GCF is your BFF. Whenever I give you a factoring problem, always look for GCF first, okay? All right, so let's do a couple examples. So when it comes to factoring with the GCF, here's the steps. First, you got to figure out what the GCF is. So you look at all your terms and come up with what's the biggest thing that divides evenly into all the all the terms in the problem. You write it outside a set of parentheses. Then you divide each term in your problem by whatever you wrote outside and put what's left over inside. You're basically pulling out that GCF. So we have some examples here. Let's look at number one. Okay. We want to factor 4a squared plus 8a. So we ask ourselves, okay, what divides evenly into 4 and 8? 4. All right. Now, for powers, I'm going to give you a shortcut. The GCF of any variable is the lowest exponent in the problem. The lowest exponent here is a to the first power. So the GCF of a squared and a has to be a. So the GCF is 4a for number one. So I'm going to write that down first. That's my first factor, if you will. To get the other factor, I'm going to divide 4a into each of these terms. So if I take out the 4 and I take out one of the two a's, all I have left is a. So that's what I write there. If I divide 4 into 8, I get 2 left. And then I already took out the a, so I stopped there. So this is the factored form of 4a squared plus 8a. Okay, we'll try that again. We could do it with three terms. We could do it with a million terms as long as they all have something in common. So we'll start by figuring out the GCF. So we'll look at the numbers. 9, 6, and 3. The biggest number that divides evenly into all three of those numbers is 3. Now to get my letters, we'll use the same trick. We'll look at the smallest power of c in the problem. I have a c to the first, a c to the first, and a c squared. So c is my smallest power, so that has to be in my GCF. Now we'll do the same thing with the d's. I have a d squared, a d cubed, and another d squared. So d squared has to be in the GCF, because that's the smallest power of d I see. So to write my answer, I'll start by writing that GCF that we just constructed. And then I'll divide out. So 9 divided by 3 is 3. All right, I took out the C and I took out the D squared already, so I don't have to write any letters with this term. Now I'll do negative 6 divided by 3. That's negative 2. I took out my C, but I have 1 left over D because there were 2 that came out but I have 3 in the original problem, so it's d squared out, d in. 
And then for the last one, 3 divided by 3 is 1. I took out one of the two C's, and I took out all the D's, so all that's left is just 1C. So that's the factored form of this one. Okay? You have a couple examples now. Pause the video. Give them a try. I'm going to go over them in this video um, so you can understand it. You have the answers with it. We'll still talk about it in class if you have trouble, though. So pause this and give those two a try. Okay, so hopefully by now you've given these a try on your own. Um, normally I like to not give away the answers on the video, but I think because this is such an important skill, I'm going to do these for you anyway as well, and we can talk about them in class if this still doesn't make sense. So for the first example that I gave you, 18x minus 36, the GCF of that is just 18, because the second term doesn't have an x in it, so I only can look at the numbers. And 18 divides evenly into both 18 and 36. So if I take out the 18 from 18x, I have just the x left. Now I'll divide negative 36 into 18, and I get negative 2. So x minus 2 is what's left over when I remove an 18 from both of these terms. Okay. The second example I gave you, we'll look at the numbers. 12, 6, and 4. Well, 2 divides evenly into 4, 6, and 12. 3 goes into 6 and 12, but it, does, but it doesn't go into 4, so I think 2 has to be the GCF of those three numbers. Okay, lowest power of A I C is just A to the first. Lowest power of B I C is just B to the first. So 2AB has to be my GCF. So I'll divide every term by 2AB. So I've got 6. I took out the A already, and there's 1B left over. 6 divided by 2 is 3. A, no B. 4 divided by 2 is 2. There's still an A squared and a B squared left over. So 2A squared, B squared. So there's your final answer for the second one. 2AB times the quantity 6B minus 3A plus 2A squared, B squared. By the way, you can always check your work with these types of factoring problems by using the distributive power, or distributive property, excuse me. If you multiply 18 back in, Notice I got the problem back of, that I started from. If I multiply the 2AB back into each term, I get what I started with. Okay, Just a little hint on how to check your work for these. All right, so now let's move on and let's look at factoring what I consider easy trinomials or easier trinomials. And I say they're easier because it's just x squared. There's no number in front here. So here's how we do it. Here's the steps. You're going to write two sets of parentheses and put x's on the left the side of each of these sets of parentheses. This should look familiar to you. This is the thing where the key expression is what multiplies to c and adds to b. That's what's going to go in these parentheses. That's how you're going to fill in these two blanks is by coming up with a pair of numbers that multiply to c and add to b. That's all we're going to do, at least in this video. So, here's a couple examples that we'll do together. So, I want to factor x squared plus 7x plus 10. So, I want to multiply to 10 and add to 7. There's no shame when you're thinking about this to start out with if you want to make a list. So, I'm going to come up with two numbers that multiply to 10. All right, 10 and 1, and also 5 and 2. So, I want to pick the pair that adds to 7. Well, that adds to 11. 5 and 2 makes 7. So... To factor x squared plus 7x plus 10, I put in my x's first, like this step says to do here. And then I'm going to stick in a plus 5 and a plus 2, because positive 5 times positive 2 is positive 10, and positive 5 plus 2 is positive 7. This is what's known, another way to teachers may use factoring and may call it by a different name, unfoiling. That's what we're doing here. In the last section we foiled. Now we're working backwards. We're figuring out what two binomials would foil to x squared plus 7x plus 10. So if you heard it as unfoiling, that's what we're doing. All right, let's look at the next example. We want two numbers that multiply to positive 6 and add to negative 5. All right. Here's a little trick. This is where it gets a little funky when we start dealing with signs. I want to multiply to a positive but add to a negative. That means both of my numbers have to be negative. 
because a negative times a negative is a positive. So let's write some pairs of negative numbers that multiply to 6. Negative 6 and negative 1, negative 2 and negative 3. I don't think we can think of any more. So let's check and see which one adds to negative 5. Well, negative 6 plus negative 1 is negative 7, so that's no good. That must mean this one works, and it does. Negative 2 plus negative 3 is negative 5. So my two factors must be x minus 2 and x minus 3. Okay? Not bad. Just have to get the hang of it again. I know you saw it before, um, but don't feel bad if you have to use your calculator to come up with these pairs of numbers. But I would say to start off, if you're having trouble with factoring, if this was not something that was your strong suit, make your lists like I'm doing here, okay? All right, let's look at a couple more examples together. Now, they get it gets a little hinky when the C term has a negative in front of it, like these examples, and that's why I put them in here. So I want two things that multiply to negative 15 but add to positive 14. So since they multiply to a negative, that means one number has to be negative and one number has to be positive. Since they add to a positive, the bigger number has to be positive. Think about that for a second. If you need to pause and think about it, go ahead. Think about why that's true. The two numbers that we're going to write in our list must be opposite signs, one negative and one positive, and the bigger number has to be positive. That's the only way I can get two numbers that multiply to negative and add to positive. All right, so let's start making our list of what can multiply to negative 15. So I think negative uh, 3 and positive 5, that would multiply to a negative and add to a positive. Negative 1 and positive 15. I don't think there's anything else, so now let's check our addition. So if I do negative 3 plus 5, I get 2. That's not what I want. I want 14. If I do negative 1 plus 15, I get positive 14, so we're good. So that must mean my two factors are x minus 1 and x plus 15. All right, let's try one more. Same idea. x squared minus x minus 20. I want to multiply to a negative, but I want to also add to a negative. So we're picking a positive number and a negative number to go in these parentheses. But in this case, the bigger number has to be negative. So let's start coming up with pairs of numbers that multiply to 20. So I've got negative 20 and 1, negative 10 and 2, negative 5 and 4, and I think that's it. So now we got to check these pairs to find one that adds to a negative 1. Well, that adds to negative 19. Negative 10 and 2, that adds to negative 8. Got to be negative 5 and 4, and indeed, negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1. So x minus 5 and x plus 4 are my factors. Okay, so once again, you've got two more examples. Pause the video. You can rewind the explanations of these if you need to. Um, but when you're ready to hear how they're done, pick the video back up again. Okay, so here's the two that I wanted you to try. Factoring x squared plus 2x minus 8 and x squared minus 8x plus 15. So again, same idea. We want to multiply to negative 8. We want to add to 2. We're multiplying to a negative, so we're going to have opposite signs. Adding to a positive, bigger number is going to be positive. So that means we can do 8 and negative 1, or we can do 4 and negative 2. 4 plus negative 2 is positive 2. So that must mean x plus 4 and x minus 2 has to work. And again, if you wanted to check your work, you could always foil this out and see if you got the problem back. So like we did in the last section, first, outer, inner, last. And then when I combine my middle, I get x squared plus 2x minus 8, which was the problem. So you can always check your work with factoring. That's one of the nice things about factoring. Because we're not really changing the problem, we're just rewriting it. Okay? So let's look at the second one. x squared plus 6x, excuse me, I don't know what I'm looking at. x squared minus 8x plus 15. So we want to multiply to positive 15, but add to negative 8. All right? 
So that means we're dealing with two negative numbers. So it's going to be either negative 15 and negative 1, negative 5 and negative 3, and I think that's it. And I think you can see that negative 5 and negative 3 add to negative 8. So x minus 5 and x minus 3 have to be our factors. And again, I could FOIL this out and I would get the original problem back. Okay? So if there's anything that's still unclear, you're not sure how these are done, talk about it in class tomorrow. We're going to do a lot more practice with this. Don't you worry about that. Um, but if you're not 100% with this, it's okay. It's just a review. It's just to get you back in the frame of mind with it. By the end of the school year, trust me, one of my major goals will be to make sure you are good at factoring. So this is just a beginning of that exposure. With that, I wish you a good evening, and I will see you in class tomorrow.